Good morning, Granville Chapel. It is good to open God's Word together, together with you today. Would you turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 89? We'll be putting some verses up on the screen, but it'll be good to have your Bible with you today. If you're up for it, we're going to be doing a deep dive, a deep dive together with the Holy Spirit. Indeed, these are the deepest waters of God is good, so why do bad things happen? It's the hardest question that we have of why is there suffering in this world? If God is good and powerful, then why do these hard things keep happening? It's the biggest picture of what is really going on. How does catastrophe look from God's point of view? Well, let's plunge into the psalm together, Psalm 89. It's a long psalm, and so we're just going to look at a few of the key verses here together this morning. The psalm comes in two sections. The first section is verses 1 to 37, and then the second section is verse 38 onwards. So I'm going to give you a taste now of the first section, I'm going to read verses 1 and 2, um, but I'll let you know right now that the second section, starting in verse 38, has a very, very different tone. But for now, the first section here in verse verses 1 and 2. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever and that you established faithfulness in heaven itself. The psalmist here is going by the name of Nathan, sorry, Ethan, and he is a wise sage, sort of like Solomon in his wisdom. And he's probably writing around the fall of Judah. So Judah being exiled into Babylon in 586 BC. Ethan knows the Lord well. And his theme in this Psalm is God's faithfulness. The recurring words in this first section are love and faithfulness. And each of those gets repeated eight times. Look at verse 14. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you, who walk in the light of your presence, O Lord. Verse 16. They rejoice in your name all day long. They exalt in your righteousness. For you are their glory, you are their strength, and by your favor you exalt our horn. So God's favor, his love and his faithfulness is what gives us our strength, our reputation, our well-being. So what's Ethan saying here? Well, in a nutshell, it's God is good. God is loving and faithful. He keeps his covenant with us forever. And so you can trust him. You can rely on him in all circumstances. God is powerful and God is on our side. He will not disappoint us. So the people who depend on God are rejoicing all day long. It's a very attractive picture. It's it's a message that we followers of Jesus are very good at proclaiming. God's favor is awesome. You should serve him because he will bless you. In short, God is good and life with God is good, always. Now remember, there's a big curveball coming in the second section, but this theology of God's loving faithfulness is not only true at the corporate, community, or national level, it's true for each of us as individuals. So jump to verse 20. I have found David, my servant, that's King David, with my sacred oil, I have anointed him. So God has found David, has found you, has chosen David, chosen you as his beloved, as his anointed. 
Verse 21, my hand will sustain him. Surely my arm will strengthen him and no enemy will subject him to tribute. No wicked person will oppress him. Verse 28, I will maintain my love to him forever and my covenant with him will never fail. I will establish his line forever and his throne as long as the heavens endure. Maintain my love to him forever. His covenant will never fail. I will establish his line, his throne forever. These are wonderful promises. I mean, I want that. I'm sure you want that. God, if, if you will do those things for me, if that's what it looks like to follow you, then I will follow you. And, and just one more push here in section one. How loving is God? Just, just how faithful is he? Verse 30. If his, that would be, is, if David's sons forsake my law and do not follow my statutes, says God, if they violate my decrees and fail to keep my commands, what happens? Well, I will punish their sin with the rod. I will punish their iniquity with flogging. So, so there are real consequences here, maybe even harsh consequences. But verse 33, I will not forsake my love for him. I will ever, nor will I ever betray my faithfulness. I will not violate my covenant or alter what my lips have uttered, says God. So God is good. God is loving, God is faithful and gracious, gracious. He gives us what we need, not what we deserve. So, so what could go wrong here? This is how good God is. These seem like some pretty bulletproof promises that I'm thinking would eliminate bad things happening to his children, to his followers. Uh, but you and I know that's not true. And today... The Bible is faithful in Psalm 89. It's brutally honest. It's willing to tell the other side of the story. So, so put on your crash helmet. Here it comes. The second section, starting in verse 38, feels very, very different. After all those wonderful words of being chosen and blessed and sustained, here's what we get. Verse 38. But you have rejected you have spurned. You have been very angry with your anointed one, your chosen one. Uh, but before, in verse 20, you said that, David, you said that we were your special choice. Verse 39, you have renounced the covenant with your servant, and you have defiled his crown in the dust. Wow. Wow. This second section, second sec section is engaging the catastrophe head on. Not only that, the, the psalmist here is saying that, that the covenant is broken. It's been renounced after verse 28 saying, I will not violate my covenant. Verse 40. You have broken through all of the king's walls. You have reduced his strongholds to ruins. All who pass by them have plundered him. He has become the scorn of his neighbors. You have exalted, not him, but the right hand of his foes. You have made all of his enemies rejoice. But in verse 22, you said that he would be invincible. In verse 29, you said that his line would rule forever and his throne would endure and the throne has come to an end. You have turned back the edge of his sword. You have not supported him in battle. You have put an end to his splendor and you have cast his throne to the ground. Verse 45, you have cut short the days of his youth. You have covered him with a mantle of shame, not glory. Salah, a long pause, a long, long pause. That's the second section. 
Despite all of those wonderful promises about God's faithfulness in section one, this is our experience in section two. Not always, I hope, but you know what I'm talking about. This is our experience. This is Judah's experience. This is Ethan's experience. And the Bible tells this story honestly. Now, you may recall that I mentioned this psalm was likely written in the time of Judah's exile to Babylon. Jerusalem was overrun, the walls destroyed, the temple torn down, the nation. This is men and women and children being carried off in captivity as slaves in a foreign land. This is a dark time. This, this is the darkest of times. In fact, we know now that the exile to Babylon became the defining moment for the people of God. I want to speak carefully here because we're on very sensitive ground, but this equivalent of the exile for us would be the devastating breakup with your fiancé or your spouse. This exile is the death of a child. It's the death of a spouse, the, the death of a sibling, the violent death of a friend. These are the losses that define our identity. It's, it, these are the losses that define time. From, from now on, everything is going to be measured in years before this thing happened or years after this thing happened. Our, our identity becomes now the person whose little sister died in the pool. Or I am the person who got divorced or fired or abused. This is part of the story of the people of God. It's in scripture and it's in our lives today. It's part of our story and, and quite frankly, these are the evidence that rise up to say that we're not loved, that God really isn't there for us. I want to pause for a moment to let this sink in. Uh, where is this in your life today? Uh, is it a relationship that just won't heal? Is it the heartbreaking loss of a loved one or a dream or something you'd hoped for? Is the catastrophe a disease that no surgery can heal, a, a pain that won't go away? Is it an awareness of injustice in our city, in our nation, in our world? Injustice that destroys lives. Some broken situation that, that really feels hopeless from every possible perspective. Maybe it's consequences coming down on our head. We did make a mistake, but these consequences are wildly out of proportion for, for what I did. What do we do with this? How do we answer these hardest of questions of good people suffering after God has reassured us strongly of his love and faithfulness? Can, can we trust him? As, as marriages fall apart, as children die in accidents, chronic pain can be unbearable. I think of the evils of human trafficking and ongoing oppression genocides, wars persisting in our world as the strong prey on the weak. Super heavy stuff. Verse 46, a prayer, how long, O Lord? Will you, will you hide yourself forever? How long will your wrath burn like fire? Verse 49, O Lord, where is your former great love? I mean, I remember the good days. I remember your words and your promises. Where is the faithfulness that you swore to David? What do we do with this? Well, if you, like me, are feeling some of this pain, some of this tension today, well, let me acknowledge, first of all, that nothing I'm going to say in the next few minutes is going to make you feel better. That would be naive, and that's not my goal. My goal is to speak truth, because truth is true. 
My goal is to invite you and me to encounter the living God, turn to him, face him in catastrophe, because only he can meet you and only he can take you through this. Only Jesus can take us through the cross, the burial, and the tomb to resurrection. If I may, I'd like to humbly, gently offer a few thoughts coming from Psalm 89 today. So the question of human suffering, if God is good and powerful, is a big question. It's the biggest question. And it's okay to ask that question. God, where are you? God, what is happening? How could this happen? I don't understand. I'm scared. I feel abandoned. Psalm 89 is saying it's okay to feel confusion. It's okay to feel betrayal. It's okay to feel like God has abandoned us and totally forgotten or cut off his covenant promises. Psalm 89 says it's okay to pour out these questions to God. In fact, Psalm 89 is saying we must bring these questions to God. Prayers of lament, the questions on our heart. We, we bring what we have today. We bring what is real. We bring questions like how long do we have to wait? The next thought, the question of suffering is the question of the human existence of human life, human experience. And every major belief system, every major worldview has to answer this question. And the answer for all of them, except for one, is the same. And that answer, whether it's Buddhism answering or Islam or Hinduism or New Age philosophy or humanism, that answer is you're getting what you deserve. This is some version of karma in action catching up to you. Too bad, so sad, your guilt is now catching up to you. But Jesus, and Jesus alone, has a different answer. And that answer is God is good. He is faithful. God can be trusted. His provision and his protection are perfect. You will be blessed and and follow me on the road to the cross. The spiritual life, the real life, will feel like death. You lay down your life. You die. Like me, you get buried. But that's not the end. You get raised again with resurrection life. This is the good news of the gospel. In Jesus' first beatitude, he'll say, blessed are the poor in spirit. The people have come to the end of their strength, who are very aware of what they cannot do, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And in his second beatitude, he will say, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. When you come to the end of your strength, my testimony to you is that we find God there waiting for us to catch us, to hold us, to carry us. And, and as we come to the end of our desire, so we're in grief and mourning, we didn't get what we wanted. When we come to the end of our desire, we don't get what we want. We find there God giving himself to us. When we don't get our desires, we find in that place that we are in fact desired. This is my testimony to you. Philippians 3, verse 10, Paul says, I want to know Christ, yes. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection, yes. And the participation in his sufferings, no. Becoming like him in his death, no. And somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead, so for followers of Christ, the, the blessing, the provision, the protection, the shalom that we long for do not look like this getting better and better every day. They are instead the check mark of adversity and suffering and death and burial and then check mark back to resurrection life. Not a slightly better life, but death and resurrection to a new life. This is what Jesus is calling us to. This is what Jesus is saying is the answer to the question of human suffering. So that's the theory, and I know you know this, and I know it too, but when catastrophe hits, we all feel that same sense of confusion and violation. 
Now, you and I know not to follow the empty promises of the health and wealth gospel. But still, isn't, isn't there some sense that if I believe the right things and I behave properly, I go to church, I give money, I serve with my gifts, I love my neighbor, and oh yeah, okay, I love my enemies too. Isn't there some sense that God then has to give me health and wealth and comfort and success and popularity? I mean, I pray those prayers. And the short answer is according to Jesus, no. No, he doesn't have to give you those things. Jesus' answer is he provides for your needs. He delivers you from evil. And as part of drawing you closer to himself, will allow really hard things to happen to you here. And there's going to be real mystery. We're not going to see it. We're not going to understand. There is not understanding in the moment. That's the message of Psalm 89. The banner over your life and mine is not things getting better and better because God is a big sugar daddy or a vending machine. The banner over your life and mine is that God is drawing us to himself so that we can be his bride. We can be co-heirs with Jesus. We can be one with him in the triune community forever. That's where this is heading. And that's a big place to be heading for. And apparently there are some big prices to be paid to get us there, to prepare us for that eternal union. But we're not going to understand it in the moment when it's happening. That's the message of Psalm 89. So I want to unpack that now. I'll point out to you that Psalm 89 establishes this incredible tension between the first section of God's loving faithfulness and then the second section of the catastrophe happening to us. God's bulletproof faithfulness versus us getting shot to pieces by life. There's real heartbreak here, and there is no easy answer. So how are we to hear this promise of David's line continuing forever, for his throne being established and enduring? Well, it came to an end in 586. But what if we look outside of the context of 586? Psalm 89 doesn't do this, but it asks the question, what about David's enduring throne? Well, with the benefit of 2,600 years after the exile, we can see, we know that what God is doing is pointing to Jesus. It's his throne, that Jesus, son of David, his throne will last forever. And then the good news of the gospel, Jesus saying, you are co-heirs with me. You are regents with me. We rule on a throne that will never end. So Psalm 86, although it doesn't say it, is pointing to, you'll understand in hindsight how God is loving and faithful. You won't understand in the midst of it. You see, God is still loving and faithful and keeping all of his promises even as everything is falling apart. But in the moment, what we have is questions and tension and confusion and a sense of abandonment and betrayal. It's very real. There's no easy answers. Jesus is the answer. And he says, follow me on the road to the cross. Keep the faith. On the cross, he'll say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But then he says, into your hands, I commend my spirit. Can we say that in the midst of our grief and struggles? Not let go of God, even though it sure feels like God has let go of us. But he hasn't. So sharing personally, I I find it very easy to trust God when I can see how things are going to work out. The challenge when I engage big questions of injustice in the world or or my own personal disappointments and suffering, my challenge is trusting that God is working things out even though I can't see how he is working things out. That's what I want to leave you with today. This question of choosing to trust him, I choose to believe that you are working things out even though I can't see how you are working things out. It is in making that choice, that choice to cling to him, talk to him, shout to him, plead with him, pray to him, cling to him, trusting that he is faithful when all the evidence is to the contrary. It's my testimony to you that that is when we are closest to him. That's when we discover, wow, he's right here. That's when I find, wow, I don't have to hold everything 
because he is actually holding me. Me saying it doesn't change this for you today, I know. But Psalm 89 is the invitation to turn back to him, even when it feels like the last thing you want to do. That's the prayer of Psalm 89, and that's my prayer for you. That when bad things happen to good people, you would choose to cling to him, to believe that he's still working things out, even though we can't see how. Amen. Amen.